My title of my message is, What's Your Algorithm? What's your algorithm? Turn to the person next to you and say, what's your algorithm? <laughs> oh, well, we're going to be looking at a story. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. You can also find our notes in the Emmanuel MN app on the app store. And we have the notes every single week. There is a story we're going to look at in 1 Kings 12. That's in, there's a pre-story to where I'm going to start reading in a moment. The pre-story is, the backstory to it is, uh, a guy named Solomon was the third king of Israel and uh, son of David. And he had prayed at one point in his life. He had asked God for wisdom. God gave him an enormous amount of wisdom, so much so that uh, they became one of the wealthiest nations in the world at the time. And he was able to follow through on the the responsibility or the dream that his father David had to build a temple in the city of Jerusalem. And that project that they had was so massive and incredible that it required the participation of the entire nation of Israel. They gave their finances, they worked on the building, the, all the tradespeople were involved, uh, families gave up their family members for months at a time to work on it. It was a very complex, diff difficult process. And as they built it, and it was finished and completed, everybody would look at Solomon and go, "Woo! you did an amazing job. Look at that project. You did it. But the reality is, is that not everybody felt the same way about it. The people that had lost time with their loved ones, the people that uh, had perhaps given up their resources. And, and so now in the change of king to king, Solomon is dead and his son Rehoboam comes into the picture. There's a different kind of storyline going on. Uh, and people, not ever, everyone sees the picture the same way. Now this last week, Jody and I were able to go see the Hoover Dam. How many of you ever seen the Hoover Dam? This is massive project and uh, it, it's on the border between Nevada and, and Arizona. And I had always wanted to go see it and Jody and I were able to see it yesterday, actually, and we were there. We were walking outside and we got to see, go down on a tour through the, the building and there's this museum at the end or a, a visitor center where they have all these graphics of what happened and what the project took. And I mean, it was an incredible project in the middle of the early part of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And it was the whole nation had to essentially come around it. There was no money. And so they were using resources from all over the place, hired thousands of people to work day and night for two years, building this massive concrete edifice. And before they could even build the dam itself, they had to blast out mountain walls and they had to divert a river. And it was this massive engineering thing. In fact, it's considered one of the engineering uh, wonders of the world. Well, while they're going through all those, and when it's all done, uh, originally it was the Boulder Dam, and then it was named after um, uh, Hoover, which he became a president of the United States. But as, as they named it, there was this big celebration and everything else. Not everybody in the world appreciated it. There were over 100 people that died in the construction process. There were people that didn't get jobs in the middle of the Great Depression. There were towns that were built in communities that didn't appreciate all these outsiders coming in, taking over their town and ruining their culture. And so not everybody saw the same picture. So as we step into this story, I want you to understand that Solomon finished the temple, but not everyone liked it. There is a deconstruction of the previous era and a desire for change just like politicians want change every year at election time. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, becomes the king. And you're going to see the new king has a choice about what voices he will listen to as he makes choices about his own futures. So 1 Kings chapter 12, starting with verse 3. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said, Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. And Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over. 
Then come back for my answer. And so the people went away. I want you to see here that Rehoboam has a choice about how to reconstruct the next era. Turn to the person next to you and say, you have a choice. (laughs) He can listen to the crowd. You know, the people that are talking to him right now are the whole assembly of Israel. They're the voices of, of everyone around him. And society and the crowd around us have a way of having an influence on what we think. The crowd around us is the crowd think of our generation. It changes its mind about important things all the time. People take polls. What's the most important? What's the most popular thing out there? I'll follow the popular thing. And ideas and values can follow the crowd. And then it says in verse eight, then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men. So there's another group of people that are speaking into the situation. These older men that counseled his father, Solomon, what is your advice? He asked, how should I answer these people? And the older counselors replied, if you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. So now he could listen to another group, the older council of people who had helped his father. Their advice was, listen to the people and lighten the load and the people will love you forever. It's actually good advice for Rehoboam. He doesn't know the crowd yet. He doesn't understand the ramifications of his decisions and these older leaders did. And so they said, listen, If you lighten it up, they'll love you. And then you can go into another project down the road. But they need a season where they're not taxed as highly and their backs aren't broken under the labor. They need a different season. So they're saying, this is what you could do. But instead of listening to the older council, he decides to go with another group, a third group of advisors. It was his friends. Look at the next verse. It says, what is your advice? He asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Man. So they're like, they're like, go nuclear on the people. You're the man, you know. In a, in a sense, they told him to do the insecure thing. Prove that you're better than your dad. Outdo what he did. And in a sense, there's always that bait laid out for people, from our friends. And that advice isn't always the best advice for us. And he takes his friend's advice and his choices literally led to a civil war. Later on in Israel here, now there's a breach. There becomes two different nations, Israel and Judah, just because of this guy's choices. Israel and Judah become separate nations and they follow a different path. Listen, following the wrong advice can really impact your future. It all comes down, though, to your algorithm. You know what an algorithm is? Let me give you a definition. An algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. Any uh, computer programmers here? You understand this. Uh, Anybody that's a computer programmer knows that you set up a set of data points of if-then statements. If this happens, this is what you do. In a real sense, when we are born, we are born and we are placed in a family. God's plan was for you to be placed in a good family. Not everybody gets placed in a good family, but to be placed in a family. And in that family, we learn the algorithms of life of how to interpret situations. So if we're nurtured and loved and cared for and we, we, are, we make a mistake, We may be disciplined, but we know we're still accepted and loved. Now, some people, they grow up and the algorithm is such that, well, if I mess up, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, and I'm out. 
So you can see that all of us actually come from different algorithms about all kinds of experiences in life. Everything from how we handle relationships and the high points and the low points of relationships, how we handle marriage or view marriage, what the, the husband's responsibility is and what the wife's responsibility is. A lot of our expectations of our spouses come from a previous algorithm. And it was put there. Now, I'm not saying which one is right or which one is wrong. I'm just saying we need to acknowledge we all got different algorithms. And then when we face circumstances, shared experiences, and we go through, some of us are fight people and some of us are flight people. Get out of here. Some of us go into this algorithm, it's like a, a natural response. But listen, when you come to Jesus, you are introducing yourself to a different kingdom with a different set of algorithms. In other words, what you once did, now uh, through Jesus, you can do something different. Not everybody understands that. Uh, this week, uh, when we got on the plane, uh, about five uh, people ahead of us, we were in the aisle going to our seat, and there was already a commotion going on, and a fight was breaking out. And I was like, oh man, this is like one of those YouTube moments, right, where you see people with their cell phones out, and and they're fighting, and there's a verbal thing, I think, but actually it's only one person. There's one guy who had got on, and he was upset because somebody had placed a jacket over his bag in the overhead compartment. He's like, I got on here early. I was one of the first people on the plane, and, and that shouldn't be. And he felt a deep injustice. Something was going on. And I'm not making fun of this guy because... I don't know what his background was. I don't know what happened before he got on the plane. He might have just lost somebody. There might be really important, valuable stuff inside of the bag. I don't know what it is. But what I do know is, is that it created a real awkward relationship with everybody around him. Because nobody understood why he was so upset. What's going on? And somebody got up and they moved it. And we were still in the aisle watching this go on. And then he got louder and louder and his arms started flailing. A flight attendant came up and started talking to him and sir, sir, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. And then he kept reverting back to what originally happened. Even though the coat was moved, he kept going. It was like a repeat. It was like he was stuck on an algorithm from early on in his life. And he got louder and louder and louder. Eventually they brought a couple more flight attendants in and a pilot came back. And, uh, when they came back, he's like, whoa, 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 a different algorithm kicked in. Oh, you might be kicking me off the plane. I can control it. I'll, I'll be quieter. But it was too late. And he had to leave the plane. So here's what I, I, I know in life, in relationships. Sometimes we get into situations where we're like, why, why am I not fitting with everybody else around me? Why is it that it seems like Things aren't working. Something inside of me needs to change. And this is what the hope of following Jesus is. The hope of following Jesus is he goes into the deepest parts of who we are and begins to recreate new algorithms. It's not instant. It's a process. But he does something powerful inside of us. Listen, I'll tell you what. We are all facing a battle of algorithms. Marketing is taking algorithms to a whole nother level. And I know you know this if you have a cell phone. Have you ever been looking at, at something and the, the marketing companies have got these strategies where they know, know what you're searching for. You look for a pair of shoes and all of a sudden you're, you're doing a search for a pair of shoes on Google and then you open up your Instagram and on Instagram, what pops up? An ad for shoes. You're like, hey, come on now. What's going on here? <laughs> you can have your phone on the other side of the room and you're just talking about visiting restaurants and you pick up your phone and what's on there? Ads for restaurants. The devil is a liar. <laughs> He's coming after you. Here's what they're doing. They're real smart, okay? They're putting in front of you what you want. And the more, or more you look at those things, the more they give you. That's what it's built to do. And the enemy is doing the same thing. 
The enemy wants to put fruit in front of you like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. See, there are spiritual kingdoms that offer you advice. And when the crowd is questioning things like the Bible and its validity, all of a sudden the serpent shows up and offers you something appealing that looks better than what God says. Look at Genesis chapter three, verse one. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit, the, the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. What does the serpent say? Ad pops up on Instagram. You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. I want you to catch this as you think about building your life on the rock Christ Jesus. Satan will always question God's word for your life. I know this as I stand in a room talking to people People often will listen to me on podcasts and other places, and they all have faith background stories of some sort. They had a moment, they met Jesus when they were in kids' church. Or there's a moment you went to youth camp, and it was so real, God was speaking to you. Or perhaps there was a moment later on in life. You remember the moment that you were called to, to marry your spouse. She's the one, he's the guy. You knew it was a God thing. You felt the confirmation of it. But later on, the serpent comes in and goes, God didn't really say that. You're not saved. You're not special. You shouldn't have got married. And the enemy will work his way in to try to get you to take a bite of something you should never take a bite of. It matters whose advice you listen to. It matters whose advice you listen to. In an era of rapid deconstruction, people are leaving their families, abandoning their commitments. Society views the church as angry and anti just about everything. And some people have given up on spiritual community because of all of the other messaging going on. And in the last 20 years, the crowd has swung wildly towards a philosophy of do whatever you want with your body, tolerance for everything. And the absolutes that held for thousands of years are being thrown out the door. You could shut everyone out and do whatever you feel like doing. You could listen to the crowd. And that would be the blind leading the blind, by the way. You could listen to peers like Rehoboam or you could listen to wisdom. Who are you listening to? Let me give you three simple advisors to help you have a healthy future. Three very simple advisors. The first one is this. Listen to the living word, Jesus. See, I'm not just talking about religious tradition here. And I, I need to be clear about it because I know when, when I speak, sometimes people think, well, that's just what churches are are pressuring people to do. I'm not saying that. Traditions sometimes, there's good traditions in the church. It's good that we bring our kids to church. It's good that we teach them the word. It's good that we have a regular rhythm of meeting together on a Sunday. It's good that, that we uh, practice generosity together. All of those things, some of which are tied to actual truths in the word and others are practices that are traditions. Now I'm not against tradition, okay? I love the tradition of you giving me a birthday present on my birthday. <laughs> so you know, I'm, we shouldn't like be against tradition. There's family traditions that are good traditions. But sometimes traditions can go away from the original intent of the word. Traditions that become laws and fences between people and push people out so that when they come in to be a part of a church, People don't sense the gospel and the love of Christ. They sense the fences between them and Jesus. 
There was a, a group of people that held the, the faith community together on the exile in the Old Testament. Israel was taken over by foreign uh, armies and, and their people were taken into exile in the places like Babylon. And while in Babylon, now all these Israelites are there, these Jews, and they're like, we need to retain our commitment to Yahweh. Because in the nation that we're in, they're, they're serving all these other gods. And while they're serving those other gods, we don't want our kids to begin to serve their gods. We want our kids to serve the one true God, Yahweh. So they begin to develop these traditions within that culture that were cultural rules to stay saved, essentially. All right. But then fast forward several hundred years. They come back from the exile, they return to Israel. There's a couple hundred years before Jesus shows up and Jesus is raised in Israel itself. And those same people that had those rules, that had uh, good intentions in those rules, were now the group we call the Pharisees. Those Pharisees now had rules that were keeping ordinary everyday people they were keeping non-Jews away. They were keeping women out. They were keeping people that are on lower socioeconomic status out, out of the promises of a full relationship with Yahweh. And their rules were actually keeping people from God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So I want you to, I want to acknowledge this this morning, that there are some things that happen in church life that originally I got saved, and because I got saved, I don't want that to happen, my bad things to happen to, to the next generation. So I put rules for living, algorithms into my, uh, my path to stop me from drifting, and we don't even realize that we didn't pass the loving purpose and the, the original motive onto the next generation. All they heard and saw were the rules. And because that's all they saw and felt, they then go through deconstruction against our rules, okay? Now, Jesus, when he shows up, he doesn't say, I'm gonna throw the Bible out. There's a lot, how many know there are a lot of rules in the Bible? Jesus doesn't say, I'm gonna come and I'm going to, I'm gonna throw that out. In fact, he says this in Matthew chapter five, verse 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So that means that when we're looking to Jesus, listening to Jesus, I'm not saying that just listen to Jesus, don't read the word. No, if you want to understand Jesus' algorithm, you have to read the word. In other words, the pathway is through the word. And we have to learn to read the word. Jesus isn't throwing it out. He's holding on to it. Here's the deal. In America, actually around the world, but especially in America, churches are beginning to tear pages of the Bible out. There are people that say, this is uncomfortable. I don't like what the Bible says in this part. So they're actually removing it from their algorithm, thinking they're still meeting with Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we have to, when we're dealing with the uncomfortable things, we don't have to agree with the uncomfortable things. We need to lean into Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the living word of God. And as we lean into him, he reveals its original purpose in our stories. And when the world is questioning the Bible, remember that Jesus backs up the Bible because he is the living word. Reading the actual Bible will help the algorithm of your heart when you are confused. You'll begin to hear truth through the voice of the word. When I say read the actual Bible, my greatest concern is there's a lot of people that are sharing quotations from somebody else that supposedly has read the Bible. Well, isn't God love? Yes, God is love. But you need to read what kind of love it is. Don't just throw that out there as a trump card over everything. You need to read it. 
And when you're confused and you don't understand the difference of prophecy and, and what about uh, social values and moral values and all what's right and wrong with the body and, and sexuality and identity, a lot of people are sharing other people's ideas. And they're wondering why in their heart the algorithms are getting messed with and they're full of anxiety. Listen, sometimes we need to mute some voices so that we lean in and actually actually read the Bible. Here's a really cool idea. If you begin to read the Bible, your heart will be tuned into the algorithm of its author. You have to read it. Turn to the person next to you and say, you have to read it. And then you'll get to know Jesus a little bit better. Philippians chapter two, Paul is speaking and he says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. How many want to be like that, right? Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude. And I would replace that word attitude with algorithm. You must have the same algorithm that Christ Jesus had. In other words, the goal is is to get more and more of Jesus' algorithm in us. We don't have to throw out everything that we were trained in. I'm thankful for my parents' training. I'm thankful for what education has done for me. I'm thankful for a lot of things. But let me tell you what. When I face the murky, foggy times that I don't know what to do, those algorithms don't always pull me through. I need to lean in and hear the algorithm of Jesus, who is the light of the world, who lights up my darkness. I need to lean in and let that be a part of my story so that I can walk confidently forward. Can I get an amen to that? I must have the same algorithm that Christ Jesus had. And this is how it happens in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, I don't have to have it all perfect. In fact, nobody here does. Newsflash. I'm going to face stuff I've never faced before. I'm going to face stuff I've faced before, but I'm different. Last time it didn't bother me, this time it does. What's going on? And when I face those moments, I have to lean in and trust Jesus. And as I listen to Jesus' voice for me, primarily first through the word of God, but also through prayer, and allow him to speak to me as he speaks to me, all of a sudden the internal algorithms of my heart are just changed. See, some people think when you get saved, everything changes. Well, it's true. Your eternal condition is different. The old is gone and the new has come. But you still got this up here. And this still runs on the old algorithm sometimes. And so you have to lean in and be transformed by changing the way you think. And what's going to change the way you think? The word of God and real life. And the two things together are how you change. The second voice that you need to learn to listen to the simple advisors that will help us have a healthy future is this. Listen to the voice of wise elders. Listen to the voice of wise elders. Proverbs eleven fourteen. without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. Rehoboam had an opportunity to gain wisdom from his father's advisors, but he shut it out. Wise elders help us because they've been through their own battles. Their history wasn't all wins. They're, they're, the good ones haven't lost their soul after their battles, and the good ones aren't controlling people. They've been through some stuff. Uh, when I left Emmanuel after, after I had been a youth pastor for 10 years and I began to serve at North Central University, downtown Minneapolis, the reason I went, I heard the voice of God and I said yes, but a big 
part of that was my mentor, Dr. Gordon Anderson, was the president there. And he was the one that hired me. And he was one of those wise, older voices. And I trusted him. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go through things in my life, but I can learn a lot from him. So I stepped into that space. And I remember early on, first couple of weeks, he looked at me and he said, Nate, my job is to make you suffer. <laughs> How many want to work for a boss like that, right? <laughs> now, I knew he was a doctor in philosophy, so there was something behind that. And I said, well, like, well, what do you mean? And he said, actually, I think that God has larger plans for you to lead more people, but you got to go through some pain so you succeed when you get there. And my responsibility is to set you up with experience to get there. He said, and he gave an illustration. He said, if, if you were going to cross the Atlantic Ocean in an old-fashioned ship, like the 1700s, 1800s, the Mayflower, whatever you want to visualize in your head, and you're about to cross the ocean, you've got a choice between two captains. One captain has, is the coolest looking, sharpest looking sharpest dressing person you've ever seen. They've got more degrees than you can count. And they've got all the latest gadget, all the satellite imagery, all the stuff. And they can tell you, because they've watched a bunch of Netflix, they can tell you uh, uh, how to get there. But they've never crossed the ocean before. Do you want this person taking you across the ocean? Or do you want the guy that walks up with a limp and has got a patch over his eye? He's gone back and forth dozens of times, faced storms and shipwreck, but never lost a person. Which one do you want to be your captain? And Dr. Anderson looked at me and he says, my job is to help you earn your patch over your eye. <laughs> the kind of people that we need to look to are the people who have been through some stuff. When you're looking at wisdom voices, you need people that have been there, done that, gone through it, maybe failed and came back. Maybe they made it through the difficult times. We need to be able to chase voices like that in our story. Younger generations are crying out for older, wise voices to speak into their life. I could line up a hundred young adults on the platform and almost every single one of them would say, I want a mentor, I don't have a mentor. All right, they want mentors. People want mentors. And they want their advice. But meanwhile, they're sitting there going, pick me, pick me, pick me. They think the way to get one is they have to be chosen. But let me tell you this a little secret to all you younger ones that want mentorship. You gotta chase it. You have to chase it. You have to ask because the older generation requires an invitation to share what's inside of them. You got to call them up. You see a couple that's been through some stuff in their marriage and they made it and you're struggling in your marriage. You need to call them up and take them out for coffee. You know, somebody that's been there and done that and overcome an addiction. You need to ask them for advice. You need, in order to get what's inside, you need to ask for it. And let me tell you this on the other side of the coin, if you have wisdom to share, you don't just walk up to people and tell them it because the next generation won't listen to you. In order to share it, it requires an ear before your mouth. You have to listen before you speak. They aren't going to listen to you and what wisdom you have until you really know them. And to know them requires listening to their story first, even if it feels too long. Because once you know them and they feel heard and understood, they're back in that algorithm uh, creation moment. They're back in a safe place where they can develop a different way of thinking. If they're in a safe place, then they can listen to your advice. You know, our church is full of multiple generations, multiple uh, nationalities, ethnicities, and languages too. All kinds of socioeconomic experience. And I'm just telling you this, the problem with both groups it's the same, it's pride. Pride keeps a younger person from asking an older person. Pride keeps you from saying, 
I don't have it all figured out. Can you help me? Why don't you drop your guard and stop trying to be the Instagram most famous person and just get, oh, I don't have it all together. I'm going to see somebody who does have it together, at least in my eyes. And listen to them. Pride keeps you from doing that. So why not call somebody today? Why not text somebody this week to take them out for coffee? Why not ask for help in that way? At the same time, those of you that are, are mature and older, pride would keep you from sharing the cracks in your story, the scars that you have. Don't just share all the good stuff. Go, yeah, we struggled earlier. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Because when you drop your guard and you're transparent and you're real, you're not doing it as one who is broken. Listen, you're on the victory side of it. And when the devil whispers in your ear, you can't share that you failed before and you came back. And the enemy's whispering in your ear about this and that. You can say, shut your mouth, devil. I've already confessed all that to Jesus. The blood of Jesus has washed me. And I want to keep this young lady, this young man from going through what I went through. So back off. I'm going to share it. And I'm going to share how Jesus' grace walked me through. Come on, somebody. The greatest loss of wisdom is the wisdom that is never accessed. Let me say that again. The greatest loss of wisdom is the wisdom that is never accessed. Proverbs 22, 28. Don't cheat your neighbor by moving the ancient boundary markers set up by previous generations. Number three, and I'm done. You need to listen to the spirit in the church. Listen to the spirit in the church. You know what the church is? The church is not a building. It's not a 501c3 corporation. The church was Jesus' idea. The church is a gathering of people that are called the called out ones. Wherever we were, Jesus went and grabbed us, called us out, and put us in a family. We're like a box of crayons. <laughs> and when he gathers us together, there's something beautiful that happens when we're together that doesn't happen when we're apart. When we're together, where two or three are gathered in his name, the scripture says, what? He's there, right? Jesus said it. Paul picks that up as a, a, on the other side of Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost and the church is born and Acts, the church is growing all over the world. Paul then says, okay, the church is there. Now when you gather together, the spirit is going to speak through each of you. Now that you're together, you're not just coming to church to, to rate how, how good the talk was today. This is not like a good TED talk, right? If this is all it is, I'm just speaking to you. You're hearing something. You're evaluating and going back. You're missing out on what church is. That's theater religion. The kind of church that Jesus is speaking of is a belief that when we gather together in our imperfections, in our weaknesses, in our backgrounds, in our previous algorithms, when we gather together, we're all leaning in to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the church so that when we would gather, Paul says, that there would be gifts for each other, that there would be spiritual gifts that I would have for you, that you would have for somebody next to you, that the Spirit would begin to speak. And if we are listening to the Spirit, the Spirit will give advice to others through you. The Spirit will give advice to you through others into your life. That the Spirit would actually come and He would speak. So when we gather together, our anticipation needs to go up. Yeah, I know what the pastor is preaching. I know what's going on in the room. I love worshiping Jesus. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful for healing. But I know there might be somebody in the room that's thinking about killing themselves today. There might be somebody in the balcony that is struggling through a marriage issue. There might be a teenager that doesn't have a dad who loves them. And this is the only place they can come to get a hug that is pure and true and loving and kind. You have no idea what happens when we gather together. 
So we have to listen to the voice of the Spirit. This is what Jesus said in Revelation when he was speaking to the churches. He said, let the church hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. This means that the Spirit is speaking, that the Spirit is noticing, that the Spirit is active, that the Spirit loves you, that the Spirit wants broken things put back together again, that the Spirit has a vision for your life, that the Spirit is not done talking. When we gather together, we're not just saying, God, give me a word for me. We're saying, Lord, use me to be a part of a greater thing called the church so that the healing can begin person to person, grace upon grace, the mercy of God poured out on all of his people. It can happen in this church. Come on, somebody. It can happen here. Come on now. Would you stand with me today? I had to end that message or I was going to preach part two right now. So, watch out. Ah, hallelujah. Just lift your hands to the Lord right now on all of our locations. Jesus, speak to us. Jesus, speak to us. We lean in. We don't always understand your word or your ways, but we trust you. We choose to build our house on the rock. Lord, we come to you even now in Jesus' name. We come to you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts. Open our minds. There are people here today that you need to you need to surrender to Christ. You've been running your own life and you need to give your life to Jesus. You can do it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Speak to us. And then we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak into our lives, speak into this room, speak into each life and heart and mind. Let there be an overflow of the power of the Holy Spirit released in your church. We ask, oh God, you'd open our, our, our understanding, that you'd open uh, our ability, our capacity to receive from you. I pray that the, the gifts would not be selfish. They would not be, Lord, for ourselves, but for, for the building, the edifying of each other, that you would flow, Lord, for gifts of healing to be released in your church. Insight, wisdom, knowledge, discernment. I pray it be released on mentors. They will have coffees this week. They'll be on phone calls, parents with their kids. I pray in Jesus' name that they'll be released in your body, Jesus. Lord, so Lord, you can build people up Build them up, I pray, oh God, that we would not, Lord, contain the activity of God in just this same sanctuary, but God, it will be released into our daily lives. The outpouring of the Spirit, we choose to listen to you even this week. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to sing now, and I'm going to release each of the locations. If you're going to go, you can go now. I'll let the location pastors leave from here, but I think we need to call upon upon Jesus even now, Pastor John Carlos. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. You won't fail. Hallelujah. Sing Christ. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock. The rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. And I've never been more glad Oh 